For the past 10 years, GBHEM has been working with Rick Deshawn to identify and test indicators of pastoral effectiveness. Through research, common knowledge, skills, abilities, and personal characteristics of effective pastors have been identified among a variety of pastors in a variety of situations. Some of you may know this as the KSAPS research that we've been talking about. Rick Deshawn has led this research team, and he and our Associate General Secretary for the Division of Ordained Ministry, Gwen Pershotham, will lead this morning's presentation and will focus on the need for the development and evaluation of effective pastoral leadership. Rick is a professor at Michigan State University and has contributed greatly to the field of organizational psychology, working with such organizations as NASA, GM, Chrysler, Ford, and municipal planners to identify ways to improve individual and organizational effectiveness. And we look forward to having him with us today. <laughs> Gwen Pershotham is the Associate General Secretary for the Division of Ordained Ministry. She is the author of the book, Watching Over One Another in Love, which many of your annual conferences use as a framework for covenant building between churches, district superintendents, and pastors in ministry for effective congregations. She, too, will help us lead, will lead in this morning's presentation. Welcome, Gwen. Thank you. I'll turn it over to them. Thanks. All right. Wonderful. Good morning. I am grateful for the opportunity to be with you in this uh, quad training. I arrived yesterday uh, after being at AUMTS and um, have um, gotten a sense of the excitement and the engagement of all of you in the work that you've been called to do. As Meg said, my name is Gwen Pershotham. I'm a member of the New England Conference uh, and very proud of that. And my, my group is right here in front of me to inspire me. I have um, been serving as the Associate, Associate General Secretary for the Division of Ordained Ministry since last November 1. So I'm coming up on a first year anniversary. It has been a year of learning and growing and uh, I am excited to be working among a very capable staff. I'm beginning my third quadrennium on the Board of Ordained Ministry in the New England Conference, so I'm here as a learner as well as one who hopes to contribute something to our thinking about ministry effectiveness and how we measure it and how we support it. I will lead the first part of this presentation, um, giving some um, references to the Book of Discipline around evaluation, share some theological foundations for ministry assessment, and lift up a covenant-based process for doing ministry assessment and evaluation. In the second part, Rick will follow that with a project history for the KSAPs and the instrument that he has developed that can be used in ministry assessment and evaluation. And after the break, uh, he'll also talk about the pilot program that is underway right now with a number of our annual conferences. And then we'll have a time for wrap up and some Q&A. The first reference in the Book of Discipline that I'd like to share with you is from paragraph 350. Evaluation is a continuous process for formation in servant ministry and servant leadership that must take place in a spirit of understanding and acceptance. Evaluation serves as a process for pastors to assess their effectiveness in ministry and to discern God's call to continue in ordained ministry. There are a couple of key words in that that I'd like you to note. The first is continuous, and the second is process. 
I think you'll discover as we move along that there is a wonderful relationship between the word continuous and process, the words continuous and process, and a Wesleyan understanding of grace. The second uh, reference in the Book of Discipline is probably one of my favorite quotes uh, from that uh, great book. Support without accountability promotes moral weakness. Accountability without support is a form of cruelty. This quote is at the heart of the process that we will present. As you all are well aware, the church struggles with how to hold together these two important aspects of our ministry, support and accountability. They're two sides of one coin, not polar opposites. And there is a way of holding these two aspects of uh, work and life together, these two aspects of supervision, these two aspects of ministry effectiveness. And I would say that the way of holding those together is through covenant making and covenant keeping. The Board of Ordained Ministry has been assigned a role in assessing ministry effectiveness or seeing to it that there is a way of doing this. Paragraph 2012, or, or two, uh, 635, um, says this, to provide a means of evaluating the effectiveness of ordained ministries, ministers in the annual conference. Suggested guidelines will be provided by the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry, Division of Ordained Ministry. In, co in cooperation with the cabinet, the board shall develop standards of effectiveness for clergy serving as pastors of congregations in that annual conference. Um, and so I'd just like to take a moment right here to ask how many of your boards, how many of um, you here have been involved in helping the cabinet to create um, evaluation processes? Is that pretty common? Not very many. Um, but it is there in the Book of Discipline as one of your responsibilities with the cabinet. And it could be that it had we had cabinet members here and we had asked how many cabinets are doing that, it might be the same number. Um, it's a really important piece of um, the work of the board and of the cabinet to see to it that this kind of a process is clear. There are some basic assumptions about ministry effectiveness and evaluation that I'd like to share. Ministry assessment is itself a ministry. We sometimes think about ministry assessment as a way of getting ministry done. But I think that that is short-sighted. Ministry assessment and evaluation is more than a means to an end more than getting a job done. It is a way of doing ministry. Or to use Wesley's words, it is a way of watching over one another in love. It is a way of assisting one another in our growth in holiness. And as such, Ministry assessment and evaluation is a theological task. Our beliefs about God, the church, and the nature of ministry are implied in the way that we practice ministry assessment. So in my little book, Watching Over One Another in Love, I uh, invite staff parish committees, pastors, district superintendents, to observe, you know, to imagine that 
somebody were to come and observe how you carry out the practice of ministry assessment and evaluation, and by watching that to articulate what they see, what they can infer from that about what you believe about God, the church, and the nature of ministry. Because our practice reflects what we believe. The purpose of ministry assessment is to align our theology and our practice. We all give assent to certain beliefs. The theology and, and beliefs that we hold are what we aspire to. And sometimes our practice, um, if we are human, doesn't always reflect our theology. And so a part of this ministry assessment and evaluation process is to assist one another in having our practice reflect more of what we believe. Or as Roberta Bondi would say, bringing our prayers and our practice more closely in line with one another. When I first went to GBHEM in 2003 as the Director of Supervision, I uh, didn't have at that immediately the benefit of having a conversation with my predecessor and I can remember sitting in my office and looking at the wall and saying, wow, this is a big ball field and um, where do I begin? And I went back and began reading some of Wesley's theology and as I read that, I became more and more impressed by the ways in which Wesley's theology was embedded in the whole uh, practice of covenant making and covenant keeping and how that related to ministry assessment and evaluation. Some theological foundations that are Wesleyan is that salvation by grace is a gradual process. We aren't made overnight. We aren't, we aren't finished when we complete the candidacy process. We aren't finished when we complete the provisional process. We aren't finished even when we retire. God's grace works in our lives throughout our life. And when we hold that assumption, it has certain implications for the way we work with ministry candidates, the way we engage in lifelong learning, and how we work with one another in assisting each other to grow in grace. Faith and fruit go together. Wesley was pretty clear about that. Um, good works flowed through a life in Christ, and there was an expectation that love was, uh, bo you bore witness to love through good works. And so the expectation that there will be fruit um, as a result of grace in one's life uh, was very much a part of Wesley's theology. It's also an expectation that we have around ministry. The means of grace support growth and love. And uh, particularly, I think, the means of grace that we call conferencing has um, special meaning as we engage in ministry assessment and evaluation. That we are in conference, in holy conference, around ministry practice and that the goal of that is to assist one another in growth. It's not about judging, it's about assisting in growth. And accountability is nurtured in a community of grace. So um, we are to be for one another that community of grace in which we give and receive feedback engage in holy conferencing about our ministry practice 
and with always the aim of helping one another to grow. The church's mission is very much a part of the purpose for ministry assessment and evaluation. And the church's mission is an urgent mission. It is a demanding mission. The importance of the mission urges us to ask ourselves several questions. Is our practice of ministry congruent with our theology? What do we need to learn? How might we bring our theology and our practice more in line with each other? The process by which we discover the answers to these questions is a communal endeavor. As Dick Yeager, former staff member of GBHEM put it, we can infer from Wesley's practice and his preaching that he affirmed the need for accountability in discipleship, that he had a method for supporting it, and that the community of believers had an essential role to play in this process. In his sermon, Catholic Spirit, John Wesley said, first, love me. If thine heart be right as mine with thy heart, then love me with a tender affection. Secondly, commend me to God in all thy prayers. Wrestle with God in my behalf, that God would speedily correct what is amiss and supply what is wanting in me. Thirdly, provoke me to love and good works. Oh, speak and conduce, either to the amending of my faults, the strengthening my weakness, the building me up in love, or the making me more fit in any kind for the master's use. According to Wesley, the approach is love me, pray for me, evaluate me, and assist me in my growth. A covenant-based ministry assessment and evaluation process, I believe, is consistent with Wesley's understanding of God's grace, a life of holiness, the means of grace, and mutual support and accountability. And so, um, in this um, next few moments, I'd like to share um, more with you, a little more in depth, about a covenant-based ministry assessment process. And as I do that, I want you to think not only about the candidates and the pastors that are to be engaged in this kind of a process, um, not only those that um, you have some oversight for, but how you practice ministry assessment of your own practice as boards of ordained ministry. Because after all, yours is a ministry, a communal ministry, that needs to be evaluated as well. A covenant is a mutually created commitment to ministry. It's grounded in our relationship to God. It says, here's what we will endeavor to do, do together and how we will hold one another accountable. 
Kenneth Poley distinguishes a covenant from a contract. A covenant is mutually negotiated and mutually binding. It is a commitment to ministry and growth. It is not externally imposed, but internally imposed. In a covenantal relationship, the persons and the ministries that are performed are cared for with great intent. So two keys are processes that are internal to us. You know, Jeremiah talked about the covenant that was written on the heart. And so many of our processes have externally imposed criteria. A covenant-based process is one in which the partners in the covenant engage in mutual negotiation about what the commitments are. So a covenant changes the way the conditions and the expectations for ministry are set. It changes the dynamics among the partners in the covenant. And it shifts the goal of ministry assessment. A covenant changes the way we approach our work, carry out our commitments, relate to others, and think about ministry assessment. A covenantal approach subtly yet decidedly shifts the goal of ministry assessment and evaluation from judging and correcting to growing and learning. And that sets something new in motion. So what does a covenant do? A covenant communicates that the business of the church is too important to leave to chance. So we aren't going to sit back and hope for the best. We're going to upfront decide what is it that we need to do together and how are we going to get that done. And we will have a plan because it's not just going to happen by accident. A covenant communicates that we have that we intend to care for one another. So from the beginning we're in relationship with one another and with God, and uh, that there is something sacred about this work that we're about to do, and there's something sacred about the relationships among those who are going to carry out the ministry. A covenant holds us mutually accountable for the commitments that we make to God and that we make to each other. Again, these are mutually negotiated, and so the the partners in the covenant uh, commit to holding one another accountable to those. Again, as Poli points out, a covenant sets priorities, it establishes structures, and it provides boundaries in which a co uh, ministry can occur and in which ministry can be evaluated. A covenant saves people from isolation. We all know that isolation undermines support and accountability. We have all met the persons that have been isolated and have uh, found themselves in very difficult places, uh, sometimes that have compromised their uh, ministries and uh, their, their whole lives. A covenant is a vehicle for assessing effectiveness in ministry in a collaborative and an open way. We're all aware of the kinds of evaluation that happen in the parking lot. And if we're honest, some of us have participated in those evaluations. But um, again, as my uh, um, longtime predecessor, said those are demonic forms of evaluation. Uh, we need openness 
um, the best kind of evaluation happens in face-to-face -face meetings. And I think that that still doesn't happen in many, many places. We have processes of evaluation in which we separate the person that's being evaluated from the persons that are doing the evaluation. And we need to move to the place where more and more we can share feedback and receive feedback in face-to-face, -face, open and transparent ways. A covenant nurtures and enables learning and growth. Again, you know, Wesley was all about going on to perfection. This perfection in love, this growing in our ability to love and to reflect the image of God is what this is ultimately all about. I've already referred to the partners in covenant making. Um, it's obvious in a way, but let me just say that a covenant doesn't exist without partners, and it can't be fil fulfilled without partners and without working in a process together. Partners in a covenant vary from one ministry to uh, ministry setting to another. So in a local church, the partners in the covenant are the staff parish, the pastor, and uh, the district superintendent to some extent. Um, in your boards of ordained ministry, there will be other partners in the covenants that you make with each other as you carry out the work that you're called to do. So it um, doesn't matter um, what the ministry setting is, a covenant is always a way by which we can work together. The process is dependent upon each partner understanding his or her role and claiming his or her authority and responsibility for carrying it out. So understanding one's role, um, it points to the importance of having clarity about expectations. If we, don't, if we aren't clear about expectations and then we engage in evaluation, uh, we set up um, a process that is unfair. It also um, calls us to be clear that when we assign responsibility to people, we also have to give them authority to carry it out. So um, that th there are some implications for this partnership. Let me briefly just review some steps in creating a ministry assessment process that is covenant-based. First of all, you have to know the context. So it's really important for a covenant to be created as close to the place where ministry is carried out and where the partners live out their daily ministries. Uh, one coven a covenant in one local church won't be appropriate for another local church. So um, it's really important to know the context of ministry because that is the mission field that the partners in that covenant are being called to. Then once you have a sense of a, of a context, you're able to begin to establish and to work out what will the covenant consist of. Covenants always involve giving and receiving feedback. And there are some rules for giving and receiving feedback that I'm not going to identify here, but I would refer you to um, the appendix in watching over another, one another in love. There are also lots of other resources that you are um, familiar with, I'm sure. But um, feedback should be specific, usable, um, and it should be regular. There should never be any surprises in evaluations. So I wonder what that would look like in a board of ordained ministry. Are any of our candidates ever surprised by the decisions um, when they're voted on to be approved or not approved? And if there are many, many surprises, um, in your board, you might want to look at what kind of feedback people are getting along the way. 
formalization of feedback happens in a, in a formal evaluation, um, but presumably that evaluation is based on a covenant and the goals that were a part of that covenant uh, when it was established prior to the evaluation. Covenants should be reviewed from time to time. Um, in the case of a local church or a pastor, um, it's best to begin this process with a self-assessment in which a person can reflect on his or her commitments and how well they carried them out, and then to engage in a conversation with others who are able to say, you know, um, I, think, I think that uh, you really are on target in these places. Here are some places that I think maybe um, you might take a close, closer look at or here are some places where I think maybe um, you missed something and I'm seeing something that you didn't see. Sharing feedback, I've already made reference to the fact that you need to share that face to face and you also need to invite feedback from the persons that you're evaluating so that it's not just a one-way conversation. Um, the other two pieces are more related to um, the process used in a local church, uh, preparing a summary and using feedback for continuing um, goal education and goal setting. So with candidates that, um, who are in process, um, meeting with them on a regular basis, I think most annual conferences do that, although I sometimes am surprised how irregular our, um, the patterns are, but meeting with candidates while they are in the a provisional process, for example, and sharing some areas that they need to work on and um, coming to some commitments around that and checking in with them to see how that process is going so that it's not all just something that happens at the end and again um, produces some surprise. Covenants are flexible. They're meant to be, they're living documents and they're meant to be uh, renewed and revised as um, the context of ministry changes. And so um, finally, um, the process of covenant making and covenant keeping is offered in response to an expressed need for the way to hold together support and accountability in the practice of ministry so that we can be continually transformed by the grace of God and more fully become the body of Christ. It is born of the conviction that support and accountability belong together. One cannot exist without the other. It is born of the conviction that support and accountability are essential for the faithful living out of the gospel. This process is an attempt to provide a method for rooting the ministry of ministry assessment and evaluation in a Wesleyan theology. The coherence of faith with ministries of love comes through a process of growing and learning and ongoing transformation. Covenant making and covenant keeping support this growth by providing a way for Christian disciples to watch over one another in love. It offers a method of holding one another accountable as each one seeks to be faithful to the specific commitments that they have made for fruitfulness in ministry in response to God's grace. By incorporating the practice of covenant making 
into all aspects of church life, including boards of ordained ministry, we will become more like that community that Paul describes in the book of Ephesians. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. May God bless you as you engage with one another and with those with whom you are called to serve in covenant making and covenant keeping. Thank you. My name is Rick Deshawn, and uh, as you heard in Meg's introduction, as you can see on the slide, I'm a professor of organizational psychology, or more generally, a professor of organizational science uh, at Michigan State University. And I'm going to try and start off uh, doing two things that are very hard for me. The first is uh, I'm going to spend a, 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 some time talking a little bit about who I am and some of the assumptions I bring to the table. Um, I'm going to do something that's very uncomfortable and I'm going to toot my own horn for a few minutes so that you have some idea of who I am and have some idea of whether you want to listen to me or not. <laughs> um, I'm also going to try to move slowly. Uh, I'm going to present you with potentially different perspectives than maybe you're used to being exposed to, different jargon, different ideas, um, and it takes a while for those to sink in and to be processed, and slow is not my normal mode of operation. Uh, standing still, and uh, that, that's not typically how I present. I'm uh, uh, fairly animated, but I'm going to work very hard um, to go slow. I'm also very excited about this pro project. Uh, uh, there's 10 or 15 years of my life in this project, and uh, so I have so much I want to say, and, and relatively little time to say it. Um, it it's a little dangerous in my, in my uh, experience. Where United Methodist, in my experience, are a very humble group of people. Um, they don't often uh, toot their own horns, even though I think many times they should. Um, one of the hard things of doing surveys with United Methodists is oftentimes getting them to admit to their strengths. You can t failings are easy. Uh, here are my problems. <laughs> but getting them to open up and actually talk about what am I good at, that's a hard thing. And so this is a little risky because I'm going to open up and talk about some of the things that I'm I think I'm really good at. And this is not an easy thing for me to do. I'm an introvert. Um, and this is not normal, but I don't have 10 years to spend with you to build the trust that I've been spending with the committee um, and, 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 and now Gwen and Meg, and so I'm going to have to try and build some trust relatively quickly. So who am I? I'm an organizational psychologist at Michigan State University. I'm a uh, scientist practitioner. I'm a, an academic in the full sense of an academic. I run that rat race. I publish. If you uh, do a search for my name, Deshaun, uh, D-E-S-H-O-N, -S and M-S-U, you'll hit my webpage, you'll see my Vita, my publications, my students, the whole shebang. So I'm, I'm fundamentally uh, an academic, a training in, at heart. Um, I, I, I live and die by publishing and by getting grants. My job depends on those things. Um, but I'm a, I was raised in the scientist practitioner model and I'm a firm believer in the scientist, scientist practitioner model. I believe that it's critically important to actually do, implement what you're studying, to be in the field and to learn about what it is you ought to be studying. Uh, and then to study it 
in your lab, study it in your, however you can approach the question, and then implement it to see if it works. And so this project over the years has been very much in line with my core assumptions of what it means to be a scientist. Michigan State University is the number one ranked uh, organizational psychology program in the country, in the world. It has been so for the last 20 years. I've been there for 18. Um, so in other words, it was good before I got there. Uh, I'd like to think I had some small parts, but it was, it was very good before I got there. Uh, I'm the, uh, as of last year, I was the director of that program. I stepped down partly because it was time to share the responsibility of directing that program, but largely so I could invest more effort into shepherding this project as we're reaching, uh, I think, a real turning point in, in, in the uh, potential of this research. The focus of organizational psychology is generally speaking broadly conceived of as organizational health. You can think of like organizational psychology as consulting or clinical psychology, whereas maybe a cult consulting and clinical psychology would focus more on the individual, we focus more on the system, which incorporates the individuals, but focus much more on the system of the broader organization. And so we look very carefully at issues relating to individual performance and as they relate to organizational performance and how decisions at the organizational level affect individual performance and how individual performance affects organizational performance when you aggregate it up. We focus on well-being, we focus on fairness in the workplace, we focus on work-life balance, and we focus on organizational change, uh, systems theory organizational change. And so a lot of my research is on how you intervene in organizations to accomplish uh, the stated goals of the organization. So, to give you a little bit of background, the project, this project on uh, clergy effectiveness, uh, pastor effectiveness, actually kicked off uh, late 1998, uh, early 1999. So, quite a few years ago. Uh, Bob Kohler, who was then the chair of the Advisory Committee on Psychological Assessment, approached me, I think largely at the urging of Mike Comer, uh, but more broadly the, the, uh, the panel, the, 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 the advisory group, and wanted an outside perspective on organizational effectiveness. The notion was that organizational effectiveness, clergy effectiveness, was becoming increasingly important. And this is in 1999. I think this was, there was a lot of foresight um, in this committee and uh, on Bob Kohler's part to get us to a place where we had 10 to 12 years under our belt so that we could be here right now when this issue is really catching fire. I mean, it's not right now, but uh, we're, we're hitting at the right time, and I think that we're very lucky that we had this uh, startup period, this extended startup period, to interface um, the United Methodist perspectives on effectiveness with organizational science perspectives on, on effectiveness. And this project has been uh, shepherded, uh, protected, uh, nurtured over the years by the members of this committee and the leaders of this committee. Um, and I know that three of the members of this committee are here. Uh, R Richard Hunt has been very, very actively engaged in uh, helping this project move forward. Laline Rector in the very back has been terrific. And I know Vic Malloy is here, but I haven't been able to, hi Vic, I haven't been able to spot him with the lights. Um, Bob Kohler, then Sharon Ruby, and, and Meg Lasse, and, and Gwyn have absolutely picked this up and carried it over the past 12 years. And so uh, uh, thank them for anything that you like in this project, and blame me for my failings to understand what needs to happen for anything that you're worried about in this project. What I'd like to describe to you are a set of studies that have been conducted um, in the, in, in the church over the past 10 or 12 years. Um, and these are collectively known as the KSAP studies. Um, that was never my intention to call them that, but that's what it's emerged to be, and, and it works for me. Uh, more generally, the, the KSAP studies in organizational science lingo are called job analyses. You identify a position, you figure out what that position is all about, and you identify the levers, the, 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 the uh, KSAPs, which I'll talk about in just a minute, that influence 
the performance, the effective performance of a job. Now, thinking of the role of a pastor, the work of a pastor, the ministry of a pastor as a job is uh, a fairly unique thing. It's uh, never in my experience have I had to cope with uh, uh, a job that is so diverse, so hard, um, uh, so complex, uh, and so difficult to nail down as a pastor. Usually I can just say, here's the work, this is what you do, and here's how you do it, and this is what you need to know and the skills that you have to have to do it. And it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, there are a hundred different ways of doing job analysis, but all processes in organizational science basically start with job analysis. And so what I'd like to describe are some job analysis studies for the position of a local church pastor broadly conceived, and then talk about KSAPs, and some of you I know have heard of the K, what KSAPs are, many of you have not, um, and KSAPs are the knowledge, the components of knowledge, the things you need to know, knowledge, the skills that you need to have, S, skills, skills are, uh, uh, improve, can be improved through practice can be modified. Abilities, KSA abilities, are the things that are not easy to modify through practice. Typically intelligence, creativity, um, are, are some of the mechanical aptitude. Um, these types of things are, are they're generally not amenable to practice. They can be changed to a small degree with intensive practice. And unfortunately, with respect to ability, it changes over the lifespan and virtually all of us are now on the decline of that. Um, <laughs> sorry for that bit of unpleasantness. Um, and per P, KSAP, these are personality characteristics, personal characteristics like integrity, dependability, conscientiousness, openness, adaptability. These are also thought to be somewhat uh, uh, stable personal characteristics. And so what are the knowledge components, the skills, the abilities, and the personal characteristics that contribute to the effective performance of the job, the work, the mission of a local church pastor? That's what these studies were designed to address. We used a uh, mixture, mixed methods, a mixture of qualitative focus group interviews and quantitative survey responses. We observed, uh, in, in all job analyses, you observe the work, you read everything there is that's ever been written on the work, what it means to be a local church pastor. And then you try to distill it into um, a meaningful representation of the work. We interviewed, uh, I boy, hundreds of local church pastors. They were identified by boards of ordained ministry, uh, by district superintendents, and by bishops as particularly effective pastors. So we wanted to say, what is what does an if we want to understand effectiveness, let's look at those folks who were identified as effective. And we did intensive focus group studies all over the country trying to identify that. We then distilled what we had found through observation, through focus groups, through reading the literature on the job into a survey. And then we went out to a nationally representative uh, sample, including, presum well not presumably, including pastors that you would not typically say were effective. And effective and middle of the road representative and collected a bunch of quantitative data. And so I'd like to describe to you the uh, general findings from that that lead to this process that we're in the place of, in, in the position of implementing right now. So one of the things we, went, we did was we went to the pastors and we said, what is effectiveness? You've been identified as effective. How do you think of effectiveness? 
in your ministry? How do you think of, what does it mean to you when somebody says you are effective as a local church pastor? And these, this primarily is coming from those nominated as effective pastors. And here, in some ways, I don't think that this is surprising. I, 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 but, but in other ways it is, if you think about what is not here. And so the and, and by the way, I should say, if you go to the GBHEM website, and you up in the search bar, you just put my name, Deshaun, D-E-S-H-O-N, you'll find all of the reports on the KSAP studies, including an executive summary uh, of the KSAP studies with some kind of coalesced tables and key results. And I think it's about seven pages long, so it's a fairly easy read. The rest of the technical reports are much more intensive. If you want to answer further questions, go to them. But there's an executive summary, an executive report. Go to the GBHEM website, and just in the search bar, put my last name, Deshaun, D-E-S-H-O-N, and you'll get more than you ever want to read about this process. <laughs> but what did they say? How did they define effectiveness? And, they, and they, it was interesting because to a person, they said, I can tell you why I was nominated to be in this process, and I can tell you how I think of effectiveness, and they are not the same. Let me just, I probably shouldn't spend time on this, but it's, I'm curious. How, why do you think they were nominated to be in that panel? Give me an idea of why they might have been nominated to be on that panel. Church, uh, okay, give me church growth. Well, give me another one. Apportionment, it's wonderful. All right, so you know why they were nominated <laughs> to be effective. And they did too. There's no mystery here uh, in terms of uh, all of them. Every one of them was involved in some form of a renovation or a new church build. Unbelievable. Um, all of them were growing churches, and all of them uh, had 100% apportionment payment. Uh, so there's not a lot of ambiguity about how boards of ordained ministry and district superintendents and bishops are defining effectiveness. There you go. Uh, very similar to what you might see in the vital congregations uh, reporting that's going on right now uh, in terms of membership and apportionments. That, take that for, I'll stop. Um, but how did they define effectiveness? And they did not talk about membership, per se. They didn't talk about apportionments and money. What they talked about was transforming lives. What they talked about was receiving and casting a vision and mobilizing the church, the congregation, to move forward on some mission. It, in some sense, it didn't even matter what mission but moving forward on something together in a connected way and developing others, developing their gifts so that they could become more effective in their work. This is how the effective pastors defined effectiveness. This has been, these components of effectiveness have been found over and over and over again and been supported in the survey results as well. I'm confident that these are robust representations of kind of the first line soldiers' uh, perce perceptions of what it is to be effective at that work. I'm, I'm also confident there could be more, this is, but these are the main themes. Let's get into some of the quantitative stuff. All right, so that's what it means to be effective. That's how you represent the notion of effectiveness. This is what you're trying to accomplish. Here, and I know this is small, and I'll try to walk you through this somewhat slowly, but here are the KSC, the, the uh, task clusters, the primary task clusters, and many of these task clusters are going to look familiar to you. Preaching, teaching, counseling. But you can see, and, 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 and from the quantitative data, we can rank them in terms of perceived, reported importance. These are self, this is self-report data. So these are pastors responding to a survey saying, um, what, what, is, what is important? How frequently do you do it? Um, with a large set of tasks, 
And so here are the main tasks, the primary clusters of tasks that make up the work of a local church pastor. And so communication, oral and written communication, preaching in public worship, number two, and I, I, just a little bit about the numbers. In some sense, I, the rank is what I want you to focus on here, 1 through 13. But the numbers, this is called a, uh, a frequency-weighted importance. And so you get an estimate of importance, and you get an estimate of frequency. And you multiply the frequency and the importance ratings together to get an, uh, a rating of uh, frequency-weighted importance. So important things can be really important, but overall, in terms of the the components of the job, if you don't do them very often, they aren't weighted as heavily as those things that are really important and done frequently. And so the ranks are in terms of the frequency weighted importances. And so you see communication, preaching in public worship, self-development, caregiving, counseling, management. Number four, five is management. Other development evangelism and fellowship. Nine is administration, management and administration. Ten, relationship building broadly construed, both within and outside of the church, the congregation. Rituals and sacraments, uh, UMC connection, and growth, church growth. On your form, I suspect it's listed as facility construction. Um, that was a misrepresentation, a failure of discernment on my part. The real issue here is growth. You can also see in the far column self-rated competency on each of these dimensions. So here's how important they are, and here's how good people are rating themselves to be at those components. You can see, I mean, some discrepancies. So for instance, self-development is rated very high to be effective you have to engage in continual self-development, and yet the competence is one of the lowest. It's a hard thing to do. It's a challenging activity. These are the major task clusters that make up the work of a local church pastor. This is a lot, if it's not obvious to you. This is a lot. Um, each one of these could be broken down into 10 or 15 subclusters. So uh, the, the 13 major task clusters really mask in some way the complexity of this work. That becomes more apparent when you move to the next slide, which is on the KSAPs. The knowledge components, the skill components, the abilities, and the personal characteristics that are enable the performance of those tasks. Right at the top, you see trust in God. Now, as an organizational scientist, <laughs> that's a doozy. One of the things that's been most personally most rewarding to me about this process is I've had to stretch um, in major ways and issues of integrity I'm extremely comfortable with. I know all kinds of things about integrity. I've got measures coming up my, uh, a lot of measures on integrity. <laughs> Sorry. I've got a lot of integrity measures. I've got a lot of research backing up. Integrity I'm very, but trusting God and calling, those, those are stretch exercises for me. And uh, it has been a very rewarding process for me to stretch in those ways and think about how you might operationalize notions of trust in God and calling uh, in a traditional job analysis, organizational effectiveness approach to understanding this work. And here you can see again the frequency weighted importance values and the ranks of these uh, 13 KSAPs. I stopped at 13 for the executive summary to keep things simple. The full analysis consists of 68 KSAPs. I think 68. 68 KSAPs that facilitate the effective performance of the work of a local church pastor. Now, that's a really tall task. 
to be good at, to be great at 68 distinct knowledge, skills, abilities, and performance dimensions. These 68 are represented in the full tech reports, the final reports. I've only represented the 13, the top 13 in the executive summary. But I think if you look at it from the perspective of a low-hanging fruit or the Pareto principle, 80-20 trade-offs, these 13 KSAPs are where a lot of variance, where a lot of effectiveness juice comes from. And so I do think effective performance of the task clusters fully is dependent upon those 68 KSAPs that I've identified. But I think we can get 80% of the variance in effectiveness with these 13. And so this is where I've tried to highlight that we should be focusing our efforts. Not on all 68, not being great on all 68. Let's first get really solid on these 13. KSAPs. Then, once as an organization movement has been made in these directions, then maybe let's go down to the other 68, or the other, the remaining KSAPs. The other thing I want to point out that I think is really important about this process is that I don't think that there's a reasonable expectation that you would have pastors, local church pastors, be great at all 68. But what you might be able to do is match church needs with the strengths on those 68. So develop profiles of the 13 or the 68 that map onto church needs. And that's a real uh, underlying goal of this process is to collect enough data. We've made a start, but to collect enough data for that matching process. Where do you, how do you match churches with gifts? And so we're, we're, in, we're in those phases as well. So rather than expect everybody to be perfect, find out where they work, will work the best. Find the match. Again, you'll notice, um, and I, next to each of these KSAPs, I've listed whether it's perceived of as an ability or a skill or a personal characteristic or a knowledge component, KSAP. And if you look at calling, you notice it's followed by KSAP. It was interesting to me because virtually every other component, KSAP, was reasonably easy to identify as whether it was malleable or whether it was fixed, whether it was a tr uh, an ability trait or a personal characteristic trait or whether it was a skill. K uh, calling could not be agreed on. Uh, I, oh, I had so many meetings on calling, you would not believe it. And, and we would talk for 10 minutes and convince ourselves it, 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 you, you have it or you don't have it. It's there or it's not there. And somebody, well, and then we go off, well, here's some stories where we, you know, it's been developed and it's been lost and redeveloped. And so in the end, I've never done this before in the hundreds of jobs I've analyzed, I've never had a KSAP be represented in such a complex way. It's never been this hard. But I think maybe it reflects the reality of calling, the complexity of calling, the, the dynamicism of calling over the lifespan of a pastor, a local church pastor. You can see some, and, and so I don't think that there are very many surprises when you look at this, but you can also see things like administration and management being rated in the top 13 and also being rated as not very high on the competence. something to think about. So what I would like to portray to you are the core of the initial years of this project basically gets summarized in those three slides. Definitions of effectiveness, task clusters, what is it that you do, a local church pastor does, and what are the KSAPs that support or enable that activity. Here is where I think the majority of effort should be invested. Um, one of the things, and I'll talk more about this as we go forward, but one of the things I worry about is I've gotten more and more exposure in the United Methodist Church. 
I'm an outsider, but I feel overwhelmed by the number of tools that cross my desk in the United Methodist Church. I just got Readiness 360 last week. Um, you're being presented with tools. I've seen some examples of them here. Um, vital congregations. I'm going to throw another one at you in just a couple of minutes. There are so many tools being developed, and they come from different perspectives. They, they don't come from a similar scientific base. And I think it leads to, a, 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 to my perspective, it's fragmented, it's disjointed, it's not cohesive. Some of those tools might be wonderful. I'm, many of them, I bet, are wonderful, wonderful tools. But they don't come from a core, a core representation that everything can be related back to. And what I would like to propose is this is the core. This is, this is cutting edge research, world class research done on this job, done from an organizational perspective, which may be limiting, but this is the core. This is malleable, we can change this. And part of, I'm continuing these interviews, I'm continuing these discussions every week. But right now, this is as good as there is. This is the best information there is across denominations on what it means to be a local church pastor. This could be, if you choose it to be, the core. And I would highlight that if you were to choose this as the core, it would bring some cohesiveness, coherence, to the way in which you evaluate and use the many, many tools that you're exposed to on a regular basis in the performance of your work. And that's the point that I want to come back to over and over and over again in this presentation. But those three slides are the core of the 10 years, that's kind of scary, of my research on this. <laughs> So I want to summarize this and then move on to the actual instrument. And so um, we've developed over the past 10 to 15 years really a cutting edge, world class scientific evaluation of the work of local church pastors, the definitions of effectiveness of local church pastors, the tasks that are performed by local church pastors, hundreds and hundreds of tasks that I've represented in these 13 task clusters, and the KSAPs that enable the performance of the tasks. This serves as the backdrop could and should in an organizational perspective on how organizations work, how HR functions work in organizations. This is the first step in saying how should all decisions be made. They should be made with respect to this core foundation. And then the next step is to build an assessment and development tool based on this science. This is, this is like organizational science 101. The first thing is you figure out what you want to measure, what it is, what's the, what's the space, what's the domain, and then you develop a tool to assess performance on that domain, and then you develop tools to predict and develop, train performance in that domain. So we've got uh, about uh, 15 minutes before the break, and I'm going to start introducing the measure. Then we're going to take a break, and I'll probably have to continue introducing the measure a little bit more. And then I'm going to present you with some of the uh, uh, results that we have in our ongoing uh, investigations, our ongoing research on the effectiveness of the instrument in pursuing its goals. So the first step is to represent individual performance in any HR intervention in an organization, the first step is you have, to, you have to characterize performance. To talk about improving performance, you have to know what you're trying to improve. To talk about training to improve performance and in intervening, developing, you have to know what you're trying to develop. And so the very first step in any organizational intervention is first to do a job analysis to figure out what the job is and the KSAPs needed to perform it, and then you, just, you develop a, a measurement instrument to assess performance. Everything then is targeted. All subsequent interventions, training interventions, developmental interventions, coaching interventions, and um, uh, uh, any HR intervention is then targeted at this. This is the target. 
And so we've named it uh, currently uh, Ademic, Advancing, I don't know, Advancing Effective Ministry Through Covenant Building. I like the title. I'm not a huge fan of the acronym. Um, it reminds me a little bit of anemic or something. I don't want that. Um, so that, uh, not, not done with the acronym. Um, but this system, I, I, I love this system I, I, on, a, on a few different dimensions, and I want to try. Some of it's just standard organizational science stuff. You could go to Dell and find a system just like this. Um, but some of it is very unique to the United Methodist Church, and it's those unique aspects that I think really push it forward. And so the, 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 uh, the instrument is a 360 feedback instrument, um, uh, like readiness 360 in that sense, with a different purpose. Uh, but it's founded on the formation of a covenant between the constituents supporting this, this, this performance, this, this, these, these behaviors, the pastor, the SPPRC, and the district superintendent to enhance both the pastor's effectiveness but also the congregation's effectiveness. And I think that that's a critical issue. You can't put it on the pastor. You can't say, make it work. You can, um, and I guess we do. But you can't reasonably expect that to be effective, to work. You have, I think, to adopt a systems perspective. You have to incorporate, when you think about changing something, you have to think about the important players in that system. And the important players in this system are the pastor and the congregation and the district superintendent. Probably, I don't know, you could change the order at different times in that dynamic. But you have to engage the congregation in that process. You can't reasonably expect a pastor to just walk in and change everything. It has to be a, a communal, a joint, a connected appro approach. And that's what this system strives to do. And this is largely, um, I, I think, a wonderful, wonderful contribution uh, that Gwyn has added to this project. So the, the, everything is online in this process. You enter through a common portal, all pastors, all uh, SP, uh, PPRC members and the district superintendents will enter through a web-based portal and you fill out a, an assessment survey. I'm going to walk you through some examples of the assessment survey on the task clusters. How well are you performing those tasks on the uh, KSAPs? And it's 360, so we're looking for agreements and disagreements between the pastor, the SPPRC members, and the DS. Those areas of disagreement are fertile areas to have conversations about and res hopefully resolve. We uh, have developed training to walk uh, individuals through uh, the use of this web-based portal. This is a Qualtrics. I don't know if you've ever heard of Qualtrics before, but it's a major surveying system. Um, and it's all based on Qualtrics. It's a very robust platform. Uh, as we transition more fully over to um, uh, GBHEM control of the instrument, it may be an in-house developed web-based portal rather than a Qualtrics portal, but th those things are up in the air right now. Um, as I'm sure you know, some churches, some congregations, and some SPPRC members are more or less technologically savvy. And so this training module is there. Hopefully they can get to the training module. Well, that's one of the things we need, we're working on. But the training model, module is there to ease the transition into using these web-based uh, interfaces for, for uh, performing the, the survey responses. Everything goes through a common web. Everybody logs on to the same place. And then once they log on, depending upon whether they're a district superintendent, an SPPRC member, or a pastor, they're shuttled off to different areas in the survey. And so here's a generic representation. Um, and I'm sure that, I, I don't know exactly what the mechanism, but I'd be happy to make these slides available to you. So if you want to d dive into them a little more intensely, you can do that. But there's a primary portal. And you come into the portal, just the, the, the web-based portal, and then you go into different survey systems, depending upon who you are, what your role is, DS, SPPRC member, or a, a pastor. Everything, all responses, are then coalesced into a common data set. So underneath it all is a big, fancy data set. 
and basically, you can make calls to that data set um, uh, using databasing techniques to generate a series of reports. And so pastors and SPPRC members see one type of information. District superintendents can see that information as well, but they also get aggregated information. So how is my district doing? So you can make district level types of decisions and bishops can see across districts. So depending upon, and bishops aren't involved in this process except at the end, they get to look at the data if they choose. I hope they choose. We'll see. Um, once, and I don't have that represented here because I ran out of space, but once the surveys are done, you go back together and you form a covenant. We're gonna talk more about that. But Gwen has already uh, done the lion's share of work there. You form a covenant, and then you load the covenant itself. And we have a form that is kind of a, a guided form in covenant building based on uh, Gwen's approach that you load back up into the database. And the covenant becomes a record that can be checked on over the, over the course of a year to reevaluate how we're doing with respect to that covenant to evaluate progress on the covenant and to have a record of the covenants made between those constituents over time. Here's just an example of uh, the pastor effectiveness survey. I probably can't read that very well, but the, the highlights here are you get a dimension of, in this case, uh, 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 on the uh, left-hand side, are task performance dimensions. You get a definition of what that task performance dimension looks like in some examples. You're provided with a standard. The standard right now is somewhat arbitrary. I'm very uncomfortable with the standards for effective performance, but as we do this over time, those standards will naturally uh, uh, become available as we see the statistics and critical incidents. Um, then you can slide the bar to represent the amount, the quality, the extent of, uh, in this case, the performance, the adequacy of the performance of caregiving. And then provide critical incidents. So give me some examples where caregiving was particularly effective, and give me some examples where caregiving wasn't particularly effective. Those, those, those are called critical incidents, behavioral critical incidents. And those become the, the material that's used later on to further develop the instrument once we have those pieces of information. On the right-hand side, you see ratings for the KSAPs. And again, SPPRC members, um, the left-hand side, the tasks, behaviors on the tasks, um, district superintendents, SPPRC members, and pastors will all fill this out. The KSAPs, uh, only SPPRC members and pastors will fill that out. The DSs won't fill out that information. We can talk about that decision uh, if you like later. The DSs will fill out the task performance. So how do you think uh, this pastor is performing on these major uh, performance dimensions? And then the DS will also be asked to fill out a familiarity rating. Uh, so some DSs are more or less familiar with the work of some pastors, particularly if the pastor is new or the DS is new. And so we want to have some idea of how well you know this pastor's work as we gauge uh, your evaluations of it. Uh, then they also notice here, we'll fill out apportionment ratings and membership ratings. Um, those are not local church pastor definitions of effectiveness, but they certainly are DS measures of effectiveness and apparently boards of ordained ministry. Um, I think it would be foolish to ignore that information. I think we have to incorporate it, but we have to incorporate it in appropriate ways. Here is the way a report uh, could be generated. There are multiple ways the reports can be generated, but this is um, the current intention and this is what a local church pastor and a PPRC member would see after the surveys have been completed by all three parties. The idea is transparency. Everybody who participates in the process will be able to see the part of the process they participated in, openness. And so you can see here 
that, and you can't read the labels, I'm sure, but you can see that the top graph is performance on the task clusters, the 13 task clusters, and you see three different colors, green, red, and blue, and those represent the district superintendent's ratings, the SPPRC ratings, and the pastor's ratings. And you can look at areas of congruence, where are these things roughly at the same level, and incongruence, where are they disagreeing? And that is the material for a conversation. Why are we not in agreement about um, the pastor's performance in these dimensions? What's, what's the cause of this disagreement? How do we resolve that? The bottom graph then are the uh, KSAPs and only SPPRC members and pastors are gonna fill out the KSAPs. And so you only see two bars, uh, blue and red. Uh, to represent that, and that will be further conversation for the covenant process. On the right-hand side, you see areas for the critical incidents, and so give examples. What were the examples that were provided by both the pastor, the SPPRCs, and the district superintendents of effective performance in this domain and ineffective performance in this domain? So qualitative information as well. This is something that I think is absolutely important, critical. You can, as we do this over time, if we get the opportunity to do this over time, we will get performance trajectories. Think about what you could do with performance trajectories, with knowledge of, okay, we saw an area that needed to be developed. Let's say caregiving in a pastor, I don't know. And we invested resources into coaching or training, retreats on caregiving. Did that pay off? Was that money well spent? Did we see an increase in caregiving after we invested those resources? You could detect with these trajectories, I could, there's so much you could do with this, but you could detect burnout. Almost immediately, you could detect burnout. You see within a year, a major drop across the board in some of these performance domains. You've got a problem. You need to intervene somewhere. You need to be in that church. You might not catch that for two, three, four, five years unless you have these trajectories. Think about it. I want to continue just a little bit more. Give me just a little bit more space here. What if you see these trajectories and you can map on charges onto these trajectories. And you can see that this pastor has been effective across charges, or this pastor has been effective in these charges, but not in that charge. What's unique about that charge? Wow, what could you do with that information? You can also get information on congregations, because as pastors rotate through a congregation, you'll see congregation trajectories across pastors. Wouldn't that be interesting information? The point, you can also, and I, I, it, things are up in the air with security of appointment right now. There's security of appointment right there. Show me, if I've been doing my job, if the DSs and the SPPRCs and I have been consistently rating over time that I've been doing my job, th there is security of appointment. That's the right right is a loaded word, in organizational science lingo, that is the right security of appointment. And if you're not being effective and you're not being responsive to developmental efforts, why should you have security of appointment? I don't... I, um, so there is so much that can be done with this that you currently don't have. And just for the taking, it's already there. We have it. If you just take it, You'll, you can have this and more. I'll show you more after the break. Why don't we take, um, I, I forget the break is 10 or 15 minutes. Why don't we take the 10 or 15 minutes break? We'll come back, continue with the instrument, and I'll give you some more data on our developmental projects. Where we're going, we, um, for the rest of this morning's session, Rick is going to finish up presenting this process in the next 10 minutes or so. You then will have about 20 minutes within your table groups or your annual conferences to talk with each other and to start to find some ways to provide us feedback. After that, we will have time for questions and answers. To moderate that process a little bit, I'm going to ask that you write your questions down on paper so we can sort those and um, 
present them to the group that way. The other piece that we are asking for, and you can send these emails to me or you can write some feedback on a sheet of paper, is to get some initial impressions from you and some feedback on where you, um, how this process could be more helpful or things we may not have thought about yet. So that is where we're going for the rest of the morning and Rick will be around through the lunch hour as well for additional conversation. So I'll turn it back over to Rick now. So I wasn't, uh, I was hopeful, but I wasn't sure what reaction I was going to get today. So I have a lot of slides in case you didn't want to talk. And uh, I have slides that I can go through rel relatively quickly in case you do want to talk. It appears I've learned a lot already just in the side conversations here. The process has already been improved in at least three or four important ways. So uh, as Meg said, I'm going to go through some of my slides pretty quickly now and give you some broad picture uh, takes on things. And then I want to get into uh, opportunities for you to, to talk amongst yourselves at the table and then feed back to us and ask questions. So again, here's the, here's the portable district superintendents. They'll be able to see aggregated as well as individuals so they can look at any particular pastor in their district or an aggregate um, uh, of their districts on the KSAPs and the task clusters, and a bishop, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, and, and again, this is individual, the prior one was aggregate, um, and here's the bishop can see all the districts uh, as well as the entire conference or individuals. So the bishop will be able to access everything across districts. Um, after all the uh, surveys are done uh, by the SPPR, CDS, and uh, pastors, then the group, the SPPRC and the, and the pastor will come together and build a covenant. The, there we have in place a covenant training program based on Gwen's book. Everybody in the process will get a copy of Gwen's book and will be encouraged to read it. Um, and we have a form that we've developed to facilitate the uh, recording of, the guide the, the recording of the, uh, the covenant. The covenant then gets entered into the database and the DS then, once the covenant is entered, the DS is notified that the covenant is available, and the district superintendent then is asked to review the covenant and provide three ways that the district superintendent will support that covenant. And it could be in the form of training, it could be in the form of meetings, it could be in the form of resources, but three ways that the district superintendent can integrate and support the covenant. Uh, that was our short break. Um, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> now I want to provide quickly, um, and, and, and the pilot study results that we're, we've been engaged in for the last couple of months are pretty easy to sum up. Uh, there is some concern with yet another thing that you want. Don't you see the task clusters? Um, I'm doing a lot, yet here's yet another thing. So there's some concern, and I think that's very valid and important to recognize and acknowledge, but the, the responses have been remarkably positive to the system as we've gone in and done our focus groups. And so the first pilot we did was a scientific review panel. We had a bunch of uh, scientists who are experts in assessment and feedback systems review our system. And then we uh, have been engaged in user panels where we're, we're working with district superintendents, we're working with local church pastors, and we're working with SPPRC members to review and engage and give us feedback on the process before we roll this out to them. Um, and we are currently started, we have currently started our initial rollout, our initial pilot study, the full-blown thing, doing it all from start to finish uh, in five conferences. So that's underway right now as well. So it's a very busy time. Uh, just quickly, uh, this is the scientific panel, and you can see up here the colors represent the ratings. And so you can see purple is great, uh, green is good, blue is acceptable, and the rest poor and unacceptable don't matter because nobody gave us those ratings. And we asked them for uh, information on content, ease of use, comprehensiveness, just general aesthetics, and the flow of the presentation. This is a scientific panel talking about our training. They generally were very favorable. Anything that they didn't like, we modified. The surveys themselves, again, were very positively reacted to. Uh, they meet this, all, everybody agreed they meet the standards of scientific, the best practices. Um, we have some quotes. I'll make these slides available somewhere more generally and, and let you know where they are so that you can dig into this. But the reactions to the surveys, the training, and the feedback report that we've developed 
um, have all been very positive, except for one issue with the flow of the presentation and our feedback report, which we've since modified and uh, received positive feedback on. So the scientific panel pretty much loves what we've done. I'm not surprised because that's what I do. Um, and the overall system was very positively reacted to uh, as a scientific instrument. The, then we went to the, what we would call subject matter experts, the actual experts in what it means to do this job, district superintendents, pastors, and SPPRC chairs and members, and asked them just a whole list of questions about ease of use, um, appropriateness, flow, um, whether the pro process would be worth their time to engage in, um, will it result in a, pro a productive, useful uh, outcome? And you can see basically all purples and greens. Uh, and, and, and these are by district superintendents. And I'm sure some of you know district superintendents. This is not easy to do. Um, so I'm pretty happy with the response from district superintendents. Some of you probably are district superintendents. Um, <laughs> And here's a bunch of quali uh, qualitative uh, responses. Um, I won't read them all, but you know, thank you for your significant work in research and testing of models assumptions. I look forward to the final product, recognizing it will continue to evolve over time. Um, by far the most effectively researched process I've seen, the district superintendents responded surprisingly positively to the, to the process. Um, pastors, I think, I, when you talk about effectiveness, you stir up a lot of anxiety. You stir up a lot of angst about what, why, why am I being evaluated again in this way? But after meeting with them and discussing the intentions of the instrument, the use of the instrument, and the potential ways that this instrument can support exactly what they're trying to accomplish, the pastor responded very positively to the instrument as well. Again, all goods and excellence. The, I think many of the pastors I've met with are actually excited about engaging in this and excited to have the data to both change the way they're doing things and show others how they're doing things. Um, covenant building as, is a concept we get, but we struggle to realize. Um, I think the benefits are many and possess tangible and intangible properties. Um, I see two major benefits, the ability for bishops and district superintendents to have a clearer understanding of pastors. The SPRC will be more engaged in a process that includes feedback and accountability. I particularly like it because of the covenant building opportunities and the balance between quantitative and qualitative feedback. Um, and we're in, engaged in uh, many more data collections, particularly SPPRC members right now and the, uh, the big five conference rollout. I want to talk and I'll, I'll, this is the end of what I want to talk to you about, but this is, this is how I think of the contributions of this process. And I think they are substantial, obviously. Um, in organizational science, um, the effectiveness assessment, the performance assessment, the performance appraisal, the performance evaluation is the core, the foundation of every HR intervention. In a cohesive human resource approach to organizations, this process is the core, and everything ties into it. And so if we can get this as a core, it provides a rational, coherent approach to thinking about all of these other instruments that are useful in, uh, in your work. This is a cutting edge, I've said this a few times, but I really mean it, it is a cutting edge instrument uh, founded on best scientific practices. One of the unique things is it contains a bunch of standardized data. And this standardized data makes it possible to compare pastors, to compare districts, to compare conferences, to have longitudinal data that means something over time. If you switch between instrument to instrument to instrument over, over the years, how do you compare? How do you develop a trajectory? There's no comparability of what those data mean over time. But if you have a cohesive, rational, scientific foundation to what you're doing, and you follow it, you're disciplined in your approach to it over time, all of a sudden the information just opens up, and now you can ask, does this new measure help me predict or develop effectiveness? And you can answer it empirically. It's not a guess. You can answer it.
You would have an absolutely fundamental system that you could use to evaluate all of the interventions. Coaching, how effective is coaching? We're spending a bunch of money on coaching in each conference every year. How much is it buying? I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. I'm just, how, what's it buying us? How much is it changing effectiveness? Let's see. We could evaluate all of these resource allocation decisions in a coherent manner across conferences. Wouldn't that be interesting? At least as important as the standardized aspect is the customized aspect of building a covenant. The covenant would be unique to each congregation. And so at the same time as you're collecting standardized information that you can use to support rational HR decisions and interventions, you get customized information that is unique, a unique product of every congregation through the, through the covenant building process. I think that's a very special component of this instrument. It's one of the things that I'm most excited. Without this aspect, it would be just standard 360. I could implement this in, in Dell or IBM or Xerox. But this makes it a truly unique process. It also makes it a unique process that is tied to science because the science says involve the constituents. If you want this to be an effective process, involve all the constituents. It says make the process public, make it participative, which is exactly what the covenant building process is. And so it's entirely consistent with scientific best practices and it yields a customized by congregation approach to effectiveness. The system is as easy to use as we've been able to make it. I think that's been responded to well. It's been rigorously evaluated over and over and over again and revised each time. The system uses a standardized set of questions which has been shown repeatedly to reduce rater biases, idiosyncrat idiosyncratic rater biases. And the longitudinal effectiveness data is just a gold mine of thinking about what it means to be effective in the role of a pastor. I'm gonna stop now, and then we can transition to uh, you spending some time in your group talking about the process, talking about the things you like, talking about questions, talking about things that you could see improved. And then I think we'll come back and uh, have you uh, ask, ask some questions from your tables. And I think Meg will be in charge of that process. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks. Thank you.